I'm Emily Chang and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology where we bring you all our top interviews from the week in tech. Coming up, Apple has reportedly hit a production snag on the iPhone 10 while Amazon rolled out revamped versions of the Echo. We'll see how the two tech giants currently stack up on hardware. Plus, Ellen Pao discusses why she wrote her new book, Reset, and what changes she would propose to combat online harassment. And GoPro unveils its most powerful camera yet. Could this be the key to the company's turnaround? We'll hear from CEO Nick Woodman. But first to our lead. Apple is already facing production delays to its top-of-the-line iPhone X. The delays come due to problems with the 3D sensor manufacturing process. Reports saying makers of the components used in facial recognition are struggling to reach adequate production levels. Bloomberg's Alex Webb, who covers Apple, gave us all the details. Well, we know from the reports yesterday initially from Nikkei there were some problems with the 3D sensors and that's causing some delays to the production process. Then subsequently the Wall Street Journal, kudos to them, they dug into it a little bit more and it's the sensor which projects the, um, the infrared dots on your face which then helps map your face for the um, 3D sensor facial recognition system that Apple has. We don't quite know the extent to which that will affect how many phones are on the shelves come November the 3rd, though? Well, that was my next question is, you know, to what extent do we know how all of these things that we're learning about are actually going to impact supply? So, you know, going back to the start of September when Apple unveiled these two phones, they had the iPhone 8 and the iPhone 10. And for the first time ever, as far as I know, um, in terms of iPhone releases, they staggered the release. So the iPhone 8 is already on shelves. You can go out and buy one, assuming they have supply. You can go out and buy one right now. There's a six-week window, though, until the iPhone 10 becomes available because we knew going into this cycle there were some problems with the OLED screens. Now, Apple said that those delays were taken into account when they made their projections for the current quarter, the one which ends on the 30th, um, but we don't know to what extent these 3D sensor delays were taken into account when they said the release date will be November the 3rd. If it was, then investors don't have anything to worry about, but, you know, on this front at least. If they did, then it might be that they're in short supply come that day and the, uh, the, they will not be able to meet demand, and that is something which might be a cause for concern. Could this be, or give us some answer as to why the release was staggered with the iPhone 8? out last week and the iPhone 10 not out till November. Yes, I mean, it could be one of the factors. OLED is, of course, the other one. Um, there are only a handful of factories in the world making these organic light-emitting diode uh, displays, which, are, which give it this sharper, um, wider display for the, for the iPhone 10. But we did know there had been some problems with the um, you know, fix, getting these 3D sensor systems working. We weren't quite aware of the extent of the issue. Um, it, it's really going to, we, we're obviously doing our own reporting, digging into it, seeing exactly what the case is. The problem seems to be in what they call the module makers. You have all these different components which you piece together to make the 3D sensor package itself, which then goes into the phone. It's there that the, the sticking point seems to be. The people delivering those components, the, the, um, they are doing okay, but it's the, the module assemblers, and that's as far as we know, LG Inatech in South Korea, and Sharp, um, the, the, the uh, Japanese company, which is owned by Foxconn. Um, those seem to be the places where they've got issues. It's interesting given that Tim Cook was Apple's COO for many years. He was the supply chain genius and, you know, obviously, you know, probably knows more about the supply chain than anyone at Apple that at this point, you know, they've been working on this phone for months, if not years. Why wouldn't they be able to stockpile some of these components for the release? I think it possibly speaks to the fact that uh, you know people have been worrying for a while about the extent to which you're really able to deliver blockbuster technological advances in smartphones anymore. So Apple has really been trying to push the envelope, get the latest technology available for their phones. The difference is, of course, the iPhone as, an, as a sim single model is the best-selling smartphone in the world. Samsung sells more smartphones, but there are, of course, a bunch of different models. Um, because it's the best-selling smartphone in the world and they're trying to do this really cutting-edge technology, Technology, it's maybe a lot of these companies are not yet at the, the stage where they can deliver all the components necessary. On some of the conference calls for these companies over the past couple of months, they had had a big capital expenditure as they try to ramp up production and meet Apple's demands. Clearly, some of that hasn't been as successful as anticipated. You know, it's interesting all of this coming at the same time that the iPhone 8 is out and there are, you know, 
people who are complaining about certain features, something's not working. What do you make of that? Like, how much could it impact sales? Well, we always see a little bit of that. There's always um, this launch of any product. There are some teething problems. Usually, most of it is, is solvable with a software patch. We had the watch last week having some LTE connectivity issues for some of the reviewers. There have been complaints about crackling audio. I literally just got my iPhone 8, so we'll have to see whether that's the case. Um, but the um, often, and Apple has said in terms of this problem with the crackling audio, that they will be able to remedy it with a software fix. So I wouldn't worry too much about those things as an investor at any rate, it's the supply issue which is a far greater consideration and concern. Meantime, Amazon seems to have found its hardware calling in the Amazon Echo. The tech giant held an event in Seattle to unveil a number of new products, including an improved Alexa-powered smart home hub, a smaller Echo speaker, and a version of its compact Echo with a screen called Spot. The product revamp shows that the tech giant will not back down to the likes of Apple or Google. Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who attended the event and joined me from Seattle, gave us the scoop. This is Amazon stepping up to the plate here and heralding itself as a major consumer technology player. No longer is it just Apple and Google and other players who can hold the splashy event to announce a bunch of new tech products in succession. Amazon is saying they're here now too and they really stepped up their smart home game introducing several new echo speakers as well as a new set top box product for the home. So Mark, you know, you review all of these products. How does this stack up to what Google has with Google Home and what Apple is planning to unveil in December with the HomePod? So Google has their home speaker. It's the center of their smart home world. Apple has their single HomePod speaker coming out in December, and that's also going to become the center hub of their smart home world. And then around those products, they have other devices. Apple has the Apple TV, the iPhone, the iPad, some iPods, and their services. Google has the Pixel phones and their Chromecast and TV products and their operating system, Android. But what Amazon is saying is, we're going to make the smart home our entire category. We're going to take over every different part of the home. So not only do they have a smaller $100 mid-tier speaker, but they have a new high-end speaker that allows you to connect your lights and other smart home appliances to your network. And a new Fire TV product, as well as a new Echo Spot, which I think, at least for me, really stole the show. It's this $130 little half-circle device with about a two-and-a-half-inch screen. It's a little bigger than, like, an Apple Watch screen. You can make video calls from it. You can watch video, listen to music, read lyrics, get contacts, learn about your day, your calendar, your weather. So what you see is Amazon coming out with smart home devices and speakers for all parts of your life. And you also alluded to the BMW partnership. We're seeing another car maker getting Alexa. So basically Amazon is trying to stick Alexa wherever you are. Do you think we'll see more partnerships in the future with other car makers, for example? So this is the third one. They announced partnerships with uh, Volkswagen as well as Ford at the beginning of the year. I haven't seen many new models with those Alexa functions come out as of yet. BMW was on stage at the event today at the Seattle office. You can see behind me. And they talked about how some of their new cars, a couple of models, one sedan, one SUV, will come out in the middle of the year with Alexa. It's interesting. Will, will someone buy a new car just because it has Alexa support in it? I don't think that's going to drive any sales or new purchase intent for the consumer on the car side. But it certainly is a big win for Amazon, being able to allow someone to potentially be in their car driving home. Their spouse calls them and say, hey, we're out of, uh, you know, cat litter for the cat or out of something. They can just say, you know, Alexa, whatever, and that will let them buy it through their car. So it's a deep tie, a big win for Amazon there. You know, in using Amazon Alexa, it certainly got the cool factor. There are some cool things that you can do, but Alexa still gets confused sometimes. It seems that this, the voice recognition uh, aspect of it still has a long way to go. Did Amazon address any of that today? Well, we saw a lot of new functionality on the developer side. So they introduced a lot of first party products, this new hardware. But in terms of functionality, they're relying a lot on third parties. So there's new deep integrations with other devices like lights and thermostats and TV sets, what you would have in your home. New ways to integrate with other parts of your life. There's these new Echo buttons, which sort of lets you make games and play games by clicking different buttons that connect to your home speaker uh, via Alexa. There is ways to go in this voice space. Uh, there is lots Lots of AI stuff that they're working on. There's actually a presentation going on now uh, that I'm missing that for this, <laughs> but it's worth it. Totally worth talking to you anytime, Emily. <laughs>
Well, Ford and Lyft are teaming up to develop self-driving cars. The automaker and the ride-hailing service have announced they will share data to develop the systems and technology needed to design affordable driverless automobiles and eventually get them onto Lyft's network. This move comes as Ford's rival GM bought a 9% stake in Lyft in January of last year for $500 million. And those two companies are still considering other options to expand ride-sharing offerings. Coming up, Ellen Powell opens up about her very public fight against sexism in Silicon Valley. We'll hear about life after the court case and the progress or lack thereof for women in tech. This is Bloomberg. Dyson, best known as a manufacturer of vacuum cleaners, will build an electric car by 2020. Founder James Dyson said Tuesday that the company is investing over $1.3 billion to develop the car, plus the same amount to create solid-state batteries to power it. Dyson said his electric car would be, quote, radically different than those being designed by other car makers, including Tesla. While well, Ellen Pau continues to make headlines, it's been five years since her trial against Kleiner Perkins became one of the most prominent cases of its kind in Silicon Valley. While she may have lost the suit, she helped kickstart the conversation of gender equality. Now, Pau has written a book about her experiences called Reset, My Fight for Inclusion and Lasting Change. I spoke with Pau and asked, what is her goal in rehashing all these details now? Take a listen. <laughs> A big part of it was just having so many women and men come up to me and tell me how much my story had inspired them and how much it gave them comfort in the experiences that they had, how, how they had connected with it. And I wanted to give them all the facts and give them the whole story and to see if I could help other people through the writing of this book. And over time also to kind of give this kind of Insp inspiring ending to what was a pretty terrible experience that you can get through all of this and continue and have a career and move forward and also uh, try to change tech and the business world. You wrote in an op-ed in the New York Times that although a lot hasn't changed, the one thing that has is that people now acknowledge the problem of sexism in the industry. Do you think if you filed your suit today that the outcome would be different? I don't know that we would be here if I hadn't filed suit, so it's hard to say, right? So we've changed the conversation. No longer are women um, forced to defend themselves. It's a much easier um, experience for people to say, I've been harassed or I've been discriminated against. People believe it. Um, but I don't know, you know, if it hadn't been for all these women who have come after me to share their stories, if we would be where we are today. But I do think somebody suing now has a much better shot. We've seen so many allegations, a rash of, you know, sexual harassment uh, stories in venture capital, at Uber, SoFi. Has any of this surprised you or are you just not surprised at all? I think most people who are familiar with um, the highest levels of tech and venture capital have heard the stories. I think what's been surprising has been that so many people have now come forward to talk about them. I think it started um, with a bunch of women who have come forward uh, in the last few years and then with Susan Fowler coming out with such a detailed and specific um, blog post and her being accepted and not being taken down. It's opened the door for more people to come forward and to change the conversation. Susan Fowler catalyzed, you know, entire investigation into Uber's culture. Travis Kalanick has resigned. What do you think went so wrong at Uber? How did oh, it get to that question. point? I think it's early on. Um, I don't know the details, but I think what happens in companies is that you know you you get this culture and you want to be hard driving and you want to push and you want to break all the rules, and that ends up not being limited to the business side. It ends up going into the personal side. It ends up going into your interactions with employees and other and your peers and the people who report to you. And you don't think the rules apply, so you just do whatever you want, and that ends up breaking down into illegal areas. What do you think, what responsibility do VCs have, the VCs who invested in Uber yeah. have for, I don't know what it is, letting the bros or bro culture run wild? I think they have a huge responsibility, and I think the investors in the VC funds also have a responsibility for letting the venture capitalists run wild. But the problem is you, you know, you've got the um, 
fox guarding the hen house. So you've got people who are not, who have, uh, who don't have clean hands, who are trying to manage people and tell them, hey, you're not supposed to do these things when they're doing them themselves. So, you know, you're, as the board member, you have a huge responsibility to the employees of the company, to the other shareholders, to make sure that the company is, you know, a company that is uh, operating within the bounds of the law and is building a culture that's going to help it be successful and that is uh, diverse and inclusive because we know that generates better financial results, better you, products. You go into incredibly fine detail about the boys club environment that you experienced at Kleiner Perkins, uh, and not just sexist jokes but, but racist jokes as well. If the culture is that broken, can it be fixed? I don't know if the bigger companies and the older funds can actually be fixed, but I know in working through Project Include and through the KPOR um, capital teams that there are a lot of CEOs, there are a lot of founders who are really committed to diversity and inclusion, and they want to build companies that include everyone, that are, you know, tied to the community, that are tied to their customer, and that are going to build the best products. So I have a lot of hope because I think the next generation of companies that are successful will have this commitment to diversity and inclusion and will be inclusive across all of their activities. Um, I don't know about you know these funds that have been around for a while and talk about lowering the bar, as you've heard, and right. you know finding that next white male nerd. I mean, it's just... Um, how do you change that attitude? That said, I mean, you're referencing a comment that Mike Moritz of Sequoia made to me a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, co venture capital firms like Sequoia, like Benchmark, they have one woman partner now. Andreessen Horowitz, still no women partners. Do you think that these male-dominated fir firms, though, are they actually going to be surpassed if they still have, quote, the best returns and the best reputation? I know a lot of women and people of color who will not go meet with them because they don't think they'll be treated fairly. And if you look at the language, you know, I'm lowering the bar to bring in people from different groups, they don't think that women or, you know, other groups are actually equal mm. to the men that they typically invest in. So, you know, how do you go and join, you know, how do you let somebody like that invest in you and expect to get the same outcome as, uh, as the other people that they're investing in or as you would get with a different investor who actually believes that you are capable and as likely to succeed as other people. That was Ellen Powell, author of Reset and Compore Capital Partner. We'll have more from our conversation with Ellen later in the show. Coming up, Facebook is making a larger push to attract advertisers as it broadens its media content. This while President Trump calls out the company for fake news will break down this new media landscape. Plus, China issues a new warning for WhatsApp. We'll discuss the status of the messaging service and what it means for Facebook's inroads in the country. This is Bloomberg. Facebook says it had success fighting fake news in the recent German federal election. The company says it launched a major effort in the country to combat fake news, deploying new methods it's developed in the months since President Trump was elected in the United States. While the right-wing alternative for Germany or AFD party made historic gains in the election, Richard Allen, Facebook's vice president of public policy in Europe, said in a blog post that, quote, these actions did not eliminate misinformation entirely in this election, but they did make it harder to spread and less likely to appear in people's news feeds. Studies concluded that the level of false news was low. Sticking with Facebook, President Trump is taking aim at the social network tweeting, Facebook was always anti-Trump, the networks were always anti-Trump, hence fake news. New York Times and Washington Post were anti-Trump collusion. The tweet comes after Facebook revealed it will turn over the 3,000 political ads it says were bought with Russian money in last year's presidential campaign. So how will it all affect Facebook's push to attract advertisers as it broadens its content offerings? Ben Lair, CEO of Group 9, and Jerry Smith, who covers media for Bloomberg, joined us to weigh in. Facebook is really making an aggressive push to try and take away um, advertising dollars from TV networks. Uh, you know, they just launched Facebook Watch, and there's a lot of publishers 
online publishers that are producing content for that. Um, so you know that that's really where there's this big push here is there's you know a 70 billion dollar market for television advertising, and Facebook wants a piece of it, uh, Google wants a piece of it, um, and the TV networks um, you know right now they have the lion's share of that, but there is some shift going to digital. Are they concerned about the fake news? Are they concerned about this Russia issue? Advertisers? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that advertisers are extremely conservative. They're very concerned about their brand appearing next to content that's questionable. We saw YouTube have a real problem with that earlier this year. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, advertisers are very concerned about their content showing up uh, alongside fake news as well. Ben, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, Facebook is successful in sort of shaking some of that money out of television. Uh, that's, <laughs> you know, that's sort of the model that we're building at Group 9 is to right. create content um, for these platforms mm -hmm. um, sort of in advance of the money showing up but knowing the consumer attention has shifted there. And ad dollars always lag mm -hmm. consumers mm -hmm. um, in sort of any big shift. And so I think over the next few years you'll see um, money start to move more and more from TV into where people are spending time, which is in mobile and mobile video specifically. Facebook and Google are really gobbling up the digital ad pie. I mean, how much is left over for companies like you. Yeah, so well, so if you look at how TV has traditionally been bought, um, advertisers are buying directly from the cable networks, yet in digital, the sort of ecosystem is set up so that you're buying from the platforms mm -hmm. rather than from the media brands. That's problematic as a media brand um, building on these platforms, but I think a shift is happening now and it's going to take a long time where um, as Facebook and Google specifically, but, but you know, Snapchat and Twitter as well, are looking at that $70 billion in TV and wanting to get it, they have to place more value on premium content because that context is so important to advertisers. And so um, in needing that premium content, they start to have to uh, share some of that pie. And so that's what Facebook has done with the launch of Watch. Facebook is now starting to actually pay uh, content creators for content. Right. Um, they're, they're doing more to share advertising. It's still early, um, but also the competition between these platforms mm -hmm. is important. And so when YouTube was the only show in town, publishers had mm -hmm. no, love, no leverage. Right. Um, now with multiple platforms sort of competing for premium content, I think it's a good time to be a premium content creator. And I do believe that there's going to be a huge business, although it will take time. And you guys have the Dodo, which has a show called The Comeback Kid, yep. which is doing very well, yeah. as uh, I hear. The, I mean, we have, we have 24 shows on mm -hmm. Facebook Watch, and we'll have many more. Because and what kind of engagement are you seeing? Well, uh, so Comeback Kids is the number one show on Facebook Watch mm -hmm. uh, so far. We're seeing um, over 20 million views per episode, um, over 20 million minutes of viewing per episode. Mm -hmm. You can hold that up to sort of almost anything in linear TV, yeah. um, enormous scale. Granted, all of our shows are not um, the number one show on the platform, but collectively, uh, in less than three weeks, we've had over 100 million views. We have over a half a million uh, followers to these shows. So I think of a follower as almost like the linear network TV version of like a TiVo uh, yeah. subscriber to a program. Um, we're building fan bases. We're building great engagement, growing engagement. Uh, we're really pleased with the early results, uh, but uh, this is going to shake out over an extended period of time. Jerry, do you think the traditional TV networks, the bigger names, are going to embrace Facebook Watch, or is it a wait and see? You know, I, I think it is a little bit of a wait and see. I mean, you know, you talk about Trump's tweet and the idea that Facebook and media companies are colluding. My conversations with media companies, the farthest thing is collusion. I mean, there are actually a lot of, there's some frustration with Facebook in terms of Facebook will ask media companies, produce content for our latest initiative, and there's some frustration that they're not getting the kind of uh, financial terms that they'd hoped for. Mm. It seems like Facebook in the last year has really made an effort to try to reach out to the journalism community, the media community, um, to really try and, you know, meet their needs. So I, I think Facebook's starting to come around, but the idea that they're colluding together is, is actually kind of funny considering there's actual real tension there. Coming up, Twitter is experimenting with one of its biggest product changes yet, expanding the character limits on tweets. We will discuss why this may be key to getting more users. And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Well,
Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. In a bid to expand its sluggish user base, Twitter is testing out a big product change. It has to do with its famous 140 character limit. In a statement, the company explained, we want every person around the world to easily express themselves on Twitter, so we're doing something new. We're going to try out a longer limit, 280 characters. For reaction, we spoke with Bloomberg Tech reporter Selena Wang and Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick. <laughs> With a small percentage of users globally, they're going to let them use up to 280 characters. That's twice as much as the current 140 characters that's allowed. Now, this is a big deal. A lot of heavy Twitter users see the 140 character limit as the defining characteristic of the platform. I've been monitoring Twitter very closely. There are already a lot of backlash, a lot of emotional response to this change of people saying that this um, kind of may have an impact on the brevity, the concise nature of the platform. But at the same time, Twitter faces this problem where they simply are not growing users. And by making it easier to send tweets where you don't have to think about condensing it to exactly 140 characters, they're hoping that more people will come back to the platform day after day. David, the idea of lengthening tweets has long been bandied about. Another way to look at it, though, is 140 more characters for President Trump. Yeah, well, you know, I think of Mark Andreessen inventing the tweet storm, you know, because you didn't have enough space to really say something, you know, in some detail. I think it's a good move. Mm. There's virtues in concision, and obviously the power users, the, you know, real insiders who think they helped create Twitter are going to be disappointed. But if they want to be a mass service and grow considerably beyond where they are today, they have to keep making it easier to use. And this is a step in that direction. Right. And, and Selena, just remind us about user growth and ad revenue. Both are struggling. Yes, exactly. They're having trouble gaining advertising revenue. Also, the monthly active users were stagnant uh, over the past few quarters, and that's a huge red flag to investors who are hoping that an uptick in MAU would show that there is a long-term sustainable uh, path for this company going forward. You made a good point earlier. This is going to allow Donald Trump to now have, have twice as much room to give his tweets. Now, Donald Trump has been uh, a good boost uh, to Twitter's usage, but it hasn't been enough to really move that MAU number up even after the election. You know, I wonder what doubling the number of characters will really do. I mean, is it really that significant a change, David? Well, I know that there are many times when I find it isn't enough space. Yes. So for me, there will, I think it's double that space really would be enough to say double, something in English. Short. That's, but it's still so. enough to have a real sentence or two. So I think it's a good move. I really do think it will make it easier. So what else, though, does Twitter need to do? I mean, is this the silver bullet? You know, I, I, I think so many of us have been flummoxed trying to figure out what Twitter should do. It's the weirdest situation, the best known company, the best known product that can't really seem to become a commercial success in a big way. Um, it's clearly not going to go away. There have been many companies that have been said to be interested in buying it, Disney, Salesforce, among others. And I think that it's possible something like that could make sense. I would hope it's almost like a global or national treasure, both mm -hmm. global and national. We can't let it go away. Uh, you know, the president's use is just emblematic of the fact that pretty much every political leader uses it to make their public statements. It's critical in a crisis like a hurricane or a flood. Um, we've got got to somehow find a way. Maybe, maybe they should start charging us. I don't know. The people who love Twitter do love Twitter, Selena. H what do we know about how long the test will last and when the company might make an actual decision on whether this is permanent? We don't know all of the details yet. Uh, I expect that'll probably last several weeks, and if the results, initial results go well, they'll probably roll it out to all of the other users. I think an interesting point, though, is when I spoke to the company, they are doing this taste test based on previous research they had found. Now, an interesting detail about this test is that it is excluding certain languages, including Japanese and Chinese, because those are languages where they found that you can express a lot more and a lot fewer characters. So they, they, they had this interesting data point that almost 10% of tweets in English reach that 140 character maximum, while only about 0.4% of tweets in Japanese reach that maximum point. So they're seeing that in certain languages is much easier than for to tweet uh, much lengthier conversations, and they're hoping that it will be the same thing in English too. Bloomberg, Selena Wang at Techonomy's David Kirkpatrick there. 
A new warning from China's government to Facebook's WhatsApp messaging service. The Cyberspace Administration of China says the service should act to stop the spread of illegal information and take proactive measures to intercept information regarding terror. This comes after WhatsApp service was interrupted across China earlier this week. Bloomberg's North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel joined us from Hong Kong with more. <laughs> Oftentimes when you're reading uh, the different rules and regulations on the Great Firewall of China, it's all about speculation. Oh, is my service blocked? Is it just slow? What's happening? Is it in the crosshairs by regulators? Now we actually got a statement from the Cyberspace Administration in response to questions posed by Bloomberg News, and they came back saying, listen, WhatsApp needs to act to stop the spread of illegal information, quote unquote, uh, in China on the WhatsApp platform and must take proactive measures uh, basically to do what they are already requiring Tencent's WeChat to do because that's a domestic company. WhatsApp obviously run by Facebook. It's uh, the last uh, remaining service by Facebook that is actually available in China. And uh, we've been having intermittent outages, if you will. In July, users reported, including myself, when I was in China in July, I couldn't upload photos or videos. And now on Sunday and Monday, outright outage, including the message, the text messaging part of the service. Uh, then all of a sudden on uh, Tuesday or Monday, Tuesday, I guess it was, uh, the service came back on. So this is a sheer, a clear warning from the authorities that they're watching and perhaps they've even found a way to get around the end-to-end -end encryption that Facebook's WhatsApp has employed. China recently fined Tencent. I mean, could fines be on the way for WhatsApp or Facebook? Yeah, you have to question what the efficacy of the fines would be, but yes, they could obviously find them. Uh, the Cyberspace Administration has been cracking down on Baidu, on Weibo, on Tencent. Uh, because in Guangdong and in Beijing, they've just, in the last week or two, uh, levied heavy fines for various uh, violations, including uh, the, the alleged spread of propaganda and also terrorism uh, material. So they're really cracking down ahead of the 19th Party Congress, which does start in three weeks from now. The big question is, are these temporary measures, which we've had in many years past before these big political powwows, or is this a lasting uh, you know, enforcement that is going to go on for years. Meantime, are there other messaging services in China that are benefiting from this disruption? Yeah, I mean, of course, there's WeChat, which is the big one, nearly a billion users by Tencent, and that is the dominant uh, ecosystem, if you will. But, of course, there's Weibo or several versions of Weibo as well from Sina. Uh, Alibaba has a few of these various messaging apps they use for Taobao for traders to communicate. I know Shanda has Uni, which, uh, and there was Momo as well, which started as a dating app. Uh, and there's Telegram as well, which came from the Russians, which, uh, interestingly, a lot of the Bitcoin uh, groups went over to Telegram when WeChat groups were being cracked down uh, could they, so they could talk about strategies about getting their money to overseas wallets. Uh, so there are a few other niche players, but again, WeChat is the dominant one domestically. And do we expect, Stephen, more disruptions as we get closer to this big Communist Party meeting? Uh, my my one word answer would be yes. <laughs> that was Bloomberg Stephen Engel from Hong Kong. Well, Instagram has rolled out some new changes to combat harassment. The app will now give users the option to limit those who can comment on photos to only people they follow. Instagram is also expanding its offensive comment filter, which launched in June, to four more languages: Arabic, French, German, and Portuguese. Coming up, more of my conversation with Ellen Powell, what she has to say about her time as interim CEO of Reddit. That is next. Plus, GoPro is betting its new Hero 6 camera will be a hit. We'll hear from CEO Nick Woodman. This is Bloomberg. Toshiba has signed a final agreement to sell its flash memory chip business to a group led by Bain Capital. The price tag? $18 billion. Among the firms in the consortium, Apple, Dell, and SK Hynix. Now back to my conversation with Ellen Powell, author of Reset and Kapoor Capital Partner. After she lost her historic gender discrimination case against Kleiner Perkins, she became interim CEO of Reddit, where she made bold but controversial moves to crack down on hate on the site. But eight months in, she was effectively forced to resign. I asked her what happened. Here's what she had to say. 
I think we had a lot of change that had to happen. So Ishan came in a couple years before I did and really tried to transform the company. It was, you know, a small startup with just mostly white men started by two white men and that culture was very strong of um, exclusion mm -hmm. and as Yishan came in he brought in different people all the women kept getting pushed out I ended up joining and um, in in I think 2013 and worked with Yishan to push a lot of change together um, you know this was a group that didn't want mobile right so mm -hmm. it was very conservative very locked into um, the product as it was and we were trying to bring it in to reach more people to have more conversations and I think um, you know and I think the change was really hard on the community, it was really hard on the employees, and it just took, you know, it took a lot of effort to get to where we got um, at the end of that. You made an effort to cut down on hate, you banned uh, several of the most hateful subreddits, and there's some evidence to show that it actually worked. Um, there's a study that came out that showed that they have, have significantly cut down on hate. Do you think that online harassment would be such a problem if more women had been involved in designing these systems in the first place? I think if more women of color, and especially underrepresented women of color, were involved at higher levels, um, it would be completely different because it's, you know, the people who get harassed the most who really understand how the systems work and really see all the ways it gets um, distorted into ultimately presenting a certain view and having that dominate the conversation. And if you can't come at it from that kind of minority, mm -hmm. uh, small group perspective, it's really hard to see everything that's going on. So how would it be different? How would Twitter be different? How would Reddit be different? Oh, I think it'd be, I think people would have invested more in um, tools, would have invested more in community management, would have had different rules, would have taken down more of a content faster and taken and banned more of the people in a more consistent way. Um, but it's hard when you don't put enough resources because those problems scale with the with the user base. And if you're not putting in the frameworks and if you're not putting in the tools, um, it gets out of hand very quickly. How much hope do you have for Twitter? I mean, can Twitter at this point, 10 years in, get its harassment problem under control? I don't know. I know they're trying and they have made some incremental improvements, but I, I really do believe that it's going to take a lot of work to get rid of all of the harassment and make sure that everybody feels comfortable participating in the platform. I think they should ban Donald Trump. I think that's a huge problem that he has this behavior that's very um, counter to the terms of service and yet he continues to be given this huge platform to dominate and to to encourage more of the same bad behavior. So you think Twitter should ban Donald Trump? Like I'm one of many people who believes that. It's not just me and I think um, with good reason. What's the reason? He is harassing of people. He, you know, he threatens people on the platform, and then he uses his um, influence to get people to harass other people on the platform. What about the people who would come back and say free speech? There's so it's such a um, red herring. I think um, there are many reasons why people say free speech. I mean, it's an easy thing. Then you can say whatever you want on the platform. And we saw on Reddit when you. When you allow free speech, it's the people who are dominant on the platform who can bully everybody else off. Mm -hmm. And there's also an issue of you know, everybody limits some speech on the platform. You ban spam, you ban um, you know, certain types of harassment. So there's not so people are not having complete free speech on the platform already. This is just driving um, the rules to protect people from getting harassed off the platform so you can have as many voices as possible. I think the purpose of free speech is to allow everybody to be able to have a voice, to have these conversations, and if a, one group is pushing everybody else off, you can have you know this free speech platform, but there are not many voices or opinions being uh, represented. So Hannah Beth Jackson, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, is pa planning to introduce a bill mm -hmm. that would explicitly prohibit harassment in the venture capital industry. What's your take on, on the bill, or how optimistic are you that legislation could solve this problem? I'm, I'm hopeful, right? I think everything else hasn't solved it so far. I think the shaming has started to help a little bit, like people coming out and saying, this is not acceptable. You can't go on an airplane and experience what I experienced, which is people talking about porn stars, talking about sex acts, talking about prostitutes, right? That, like, that's not acceptable anymore, and now you know that, so you should change your behavior. But 
you know, I'm hearing it's not changing quite yet, so we need something else to help, and everything I think will help, but I don't think that's going to be the one thing that prevents it, because these people do think that they're above the law. They don't think the law applies to them, so you need to keep pushing that public perception and pushing, you know, and telling the stories. I think the most impactful thing is all of these women telling their stories. On that last note, you know, you mentioned the porn-obsessed CEO. We saw that uh, also in your the excerpt of your book. You don't mention his name. His name did come up in the trial. Why did you leave his name out? And, you know, what else did you leave out? I'm sure, you know, there's a lot that you didn't put in there for various I reasons. wanted the book to be as fair as possible. So um, with the CEO, I don't know him that well. Maybe he had an off day. Maybe he was goaded into doing something by Ted. I, I just don't know. So I didn't want to have this one incident kind of um, you know, this one experience for five hours be the the way that I portrayed him to the whole public. Um, I think I tried to be fair. I tried to keep people's families out of it. I tried to, um, you know, I had a friend and, and our view was like no collateral damage. So these, you know, you have the people who are the protagonists and who are the main people that I interacted with and who helped me back and who are holding a lot of other people back. And they were the people I wanted the story to focus on. Coming up, GoPro stock got a big boost last month on anticipation for the Hero 6. Now we get a first look at the device and hear from CEO Nick Woodman next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. GoPro is calling the new Hero 6 camera the most powerful and convenient ever released by the company. And they're betting big on the device. Anticipation for the Hero 6 helped boost third quarter guidance and could be the key to the camera maker's turnaround. Bloomberg's Selena Wang spoke with GoPro CEO Nick Woodman. GoPro has to keep innovating and coming out with new and exciting products that excite consumers. And I think we did that today with Hero 6 Black and Fusion. Hero 6 Black is far and away the most exciting and capable and easy to use GoPro that we've ever made. And then Fusion pushes GoPro into a totally new market with 360 spherical cameras. Um, we think this is going to play an important role in the future of how people capture and share themselves and Fusion is our first new product. Um, and then we also made important advancements with Karma. It now has follow me functions and a cool new lookup feature that allows Karma to film what's above it, which is unique in drones. So I think that we're showing that GoPro is continuing to innovate and continue, continuing to excite consumers. So Karma and the spherical Fusion camera are new additions to the product line. How else are we going to see it evolve beyond the traditional action cameras? Well, a big part of GoPro's future is we now see a GoPro as an untethered lens for your phone. Uh, what we mean by that is a GoPro now automatically copies any new photos and videos you capture over to your phone. And the GoPro app then creates a video for you. So when you use a GoPro, it's like using a separate untethered lens that offloads all its footage to your phone. So really a GoPro is the ultimate capture complement to a phone and that as we think of ourselves in that way and we think about new types of GoPros, new types of untethered lenses, we think we can dramatically expand our market. Action cameras are maturing, smartphones are getting even better and more durable and waterproof. Mm -hmm. So what's your pitch to those consumers who say we don't need, I don't need another camera, my smartphone's good enough? Well. I think that a phone is a phenomenal camera. It's often in your pocket, and it's right there reactively when you want to film somebody or something else happening. But there's a lot of activities where you don't want to pull out your phone. You want to be more in the moment. And you also don't want to film somebody else. You want to film yourself. And so GoPro, with its untethered lens strategy, we think that we can 
make lenses that complement somebody's use of a phone, but not require them to pull the phone out or not even have the phone on them. Now the Hero 6 is using a custom design processor. This is the first time. So why decide to go this route and what types of challenges are associated with making this yourself? Oh, well, designing and developing a processor with a partner as we did, uh, there's always risks involved. But there's also a risk that when you're reliant on others innovation and ingenuity that they put into their own work, into their own processors. And we found that what we wanted to do with Hero 6 Black, we couldn't do with any other processor that was on the market. So we had to develop our own. Um, it allowed us to hit cost targets for the product. Uh, if we had even been able to do this with somebody else, Hero 6 Black would have had to be more expensive to the end consumer, so that's not good. So we were able to deliver Hero 6 at a lower price point, and we were able to hit performance levels that would, uh, would have otherwise been impossible. So last year we're, was a we're challenge. taking our destiny into our own hands from a technology standpoint. And on that point, last year was pretty challenging from a technical standpoint. There were some product delays. So what have you learned from those experiences to make sure that the rollout of this year's products are seamless? We're doing fewer things better. In previous years, we had other businesses we were running, like our media business. We had many uh, programs going on in uh, products that consumers never saw that were more targeted towards professionals. Uh, we cut all of that and focused GoPro on what it does best and what our whole vision and mission is, is to help people capture and share their lives so that they can celebrate the moment in a way that they just can't with any other camera. Being a hardware company is very difficult. In the public markets, GoPro shares have fallen quite dramatically since the IPO. So what are investors missing? I think investors are missing that we're growing again. The previous comp of 2016, uh, people think that uh, unit sales are way down, volumes were higher in previous years. But what they need to look at is that volumes of our premium products, 299 and above, are growing. We're selling more of the products that matter and of the products that have better margin for GoPro and make us more profit. So GoPro is healthy and it's growing and I think, I think investors are starting to take notice. And let's quickly talk about drones. Uh, many analysts say that the market leader DJI has superior features and a similar price point. So given those market effects, how much of a revenue driver do you see uh, drones becoming for GoPro? We're really excited about drones. Karma is doing well. It's a phenomenal accessory for the GoPro community. Um, it's very versatile uh, with the detachable gimbal and how it connects to the Karma grip. and. The, our customers have spoken. They really like that flexibility, that versatility, and Karma continues to get better. You know, today we announced Follow Me features, as well as uh, a lookup feature that allows Karma to film what's above it, which, as I mentioned, is unique to drones. And we're going to continue to uh, innovate and advance our drone offering uh, into what comes after Karma. That was GoPro CEO Nick Woodman. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in each day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.